but there are still concerns with the efficiency and operation of the various special forces teams. Both Eagle Claw and Urgent Fury make it abundantly clear a spirit of joint cooperation between special forces is required. After a reassessment of the Special Operations Command structure, the government establishes the U.S. Special Operations Command, signed into existence by President Reagan on April 16, 1987, replacing the United States Readiness Command, U.S. SOCOM, is activated with General James Lindsay, former head of U.S. REDCOM, as its first Commander-in-Chief. U.S. SOCOM is mere months old when a joint operation with the Night Stalkers, SEALs, and Special Boat Teams puts the new organization to the test. Operation Earnest Will is implemented to provide safe passage for neutral oil tankers during the Iran-Iraq War. Special forces are put in conflict with Iranian terrorists. Transforming two oil servicing barges into mobile sea bases, special forces are able to stop Iranian mining and boat attacks. When the USS Samuel B. Roberts is damaged by an Iranian mine, American forces retaliate through Operation Praying Mantis, an attack on two Iranian frigates and two oil platforms. That, and the unfortunate bombing by a U.S. ship of Iran Air Flight 655, leads Iran to end hostilities against Iraq. The United States had maintained a relationship with Panamanian General Manuel Noriega as an intelligence asset. It comes to the attention of the U.S. government that while pulling money in from the U.S. as a paid informant, he was double dealing with Panamanian drug dealers. The U.S. is concerned with the security of the Panama Canal as both American property and as an important strategic location. When Noriega refuses to relinquish his role as the dictator of Panama, despite losing to overwhelming numbers in the national elections, an allegedly unprovoked attack on four unarmed U.S. military personnel by Noriega's Panamanian Defense Forces on December 16, 1989, leaves one dead, while two American witnesses are assaulted by PDF officers. President George H.W. Bush orders an invasion of Panama the next day. Noriega declared his military dictatorship to be in a state of war with the United States and publicly threatened the lives of Americans in Panama. The very next day, forces under his command shot and killed an, un an unarmed American serviceman, wounded another, arrested and brutally beat a third American serviceman, and then brutally interrogated uh, his wife, threatening her with sexual abuse. That was enough. General Noriega's reckless threats and attacks upon Americans in Panama created an imminent danger to the 35,000 American citizens in Panama. As president, I have no higher obligation than to safeguard the lives of American citizens. And that is why I directed our armed forces to protect the lives of American citizens in Panama and to bring General Noriega to justice in the United States. I contacted the bipartisan leadership of Congress last night and informed them of this decision. And after taking this action, I also talked with leaders in Latin America, the Caribbean, and uh, those of other U.S. allies. At this moment, U.S. forces, including forces deployed from the United States last night, are engaged in action in Panama. The United States intends to withdraw the forces newly deployed to Panama as quickly as possible. Our forces have conducted themselves courageously and selflessly. And as Commander-in-Chief, I salute every one of them and thank them on behalf of our country. All four branches of the military take part in Operation Just Cause, with ground forces that also boast a Joint Special Operations Task Force the invasion begins at 0100 hours on December 20, 1989, with a force of 27,684 troopers descending upon Panama. They strike fast and with precision. Airfields and Panamanian Defense Forces barracks, even Fort Amador, in close proximity to the canal, are taken. But what of the fallen dictator? 
it is up to SEAL Team 4 to capture Noriega. They dub it Operation Nifty Package. First, a team of 48 SEALs take out Noriega's private jet, a ticket out of Panama, at the Punta Paitia Airport in Panama City. Four SEALs are killed in the gunfight, until the jet is destroyed by an AT-4 rocket. Next is his gunboat on the canal. Because of its heavy armament, it will require stealth. Four SEAL divers dodge grenades while testing the limits of their scuba gear to attach a pair of bombs to the hull. With the boat destroyed, Noriega is trapped. Meanwhile, Delta Force is given the mission of freeing an American civilian and purported CIA operative, Kurt Muse. Muse had been imprisoned in Panama's notorious prison, Carcel Modelo, for transmitting anti-Noriega messages on radio. 23 Delta operators, accompanied by night stalkers, land on the prison's roof and work their way down to Muse's cell. Muse's guard is killed before he himself can kill the prisoner. The American is given body armor and escorted back to the roof by Delta operators, where they are extracted by helicopter. Then, things go awry. The little bird bearing Muse crashes. Four Delta Force operators are wounded, while Muse and four others remain uninjured. They hole up in a nearby building, where the 5th Infantry Division arrives in an armored personnel carrier for extraction. Noriega seeks refuge in the Apostolic Nunciature Church, itself the default embassy. The Monsignor Laboa allows the fallen dictator in, secretly hoping to convince his surrender to the United States forces. As Noriega sits in the unair conditioned room with nothing more than a Bible to read, American forces are in a bind. To take the church would violate international law and cause controversy. The government turns to the Vatican, who, in accordance with church customs, refuses to turn him over. All that is left is psychological warfare. Rock and roll music is blared at deafening levels from the perimeter for three days. On January 3rd, after urging by Monsignor Laboa, Noriega surrenders to American forces. Trouble has been brewing in the Middle East for some time, even beyond the Iran-Iraq War. On July 23, 1990, Iraqi forces, 30,000 strong, converge on the border with Kuwait. According to Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein, Kuwait's recent negotiations with Iran and Syria were costing Iraq. To Hussein, America is the enemy. The United States, claiming neutrality, may be forced to respond to Iraqi aggression towards Kuwait. On August 2nd, Iraq bombs Kuwait's capital city. The invasion is swift, and Iraq is soon in control of their rival country, with Hussein making his cousin, Ali Hassan al-Majid, the country's new governor. President Bush and the world are mortified at Iraq's actions. The United Nations recognizes that with Kuwait under Iraqi control, Saudi Arabia and its valuable oil fields could give Hussein a grasp on the majority of the world's resources. President Bush announces Operation Desert Shield, designed to protect Saudi Arabia. It soon evolves into an air campaign dubbed Operation Desert Storm. The ground attack is christened Operation Desert Sabre. The coalition is formed between America and 13 other countries, a united front designed to keep Hussein from gaining a strategic advantage over the world. Starting that month through December, the Marine Expeditionary Force, or MEF, is at the forefront of military activities. Intelligence gathering and reconnaissance missions accompany the hunt for Scud missile sites. These Soviet-designed missiles, often launched from the back of trucks, are skillfully hidden by Iraqi forces. Since they are mobile, they are not dependent upon a launch site. The Scud will become amongst Iraq's most powerful weapons. The MEF venture towards enemy lines to map out positions and rain artillery fire on Iraqi armor and engage in battle sooner than the main ground forces will. Two other divisions of MEF on the sea hold 50,000 Iraqi soldiers in check on the shoreline. 
The Night Stalkers, piloting Chinook helicopters, are vital in covertly dropping special forces teams behind Iraqi lines, and also rescuing downed coalition pilots. Delta Force works in conjunction with the MEF and other special forces, including the British SAS, in the Scud Hunt. They also provide additional protection for U.S. General Norman Schwarzkopf in Saudi Arabia. The Delta operatives send a blow to Hussein's plans on the final day of the ground war. As Iraqi forces are violently flushed out of Kuwait by the coalition, Delta Force discover 26 Scud missiles in Iraq. They are aimed at Israel. An attack on Israel would lure them into the conflict and upset the Arab coalition. The Delta operatives are an entire 3,000 yards from the launch site. Armed only with 50 caliber snap rifles, their unerring accuracy punctures the missile's fuel tanks and destroy the Iraqi soldiers manning the Scuds. According to General Schwarzkopf in a letter following, you guys kept Israel out of the war. By February 28th, almost the entire Iraqi army inhabiting Kuwait is encircled by coalition forces, their power greatly diminished. On March 6, 1991, President Bush announces victory against Iraq. From the moment Operation Desert Storm commenced on January 16th until the time the guns fell silent at midnight one week ago, this nation has watched its sons and daughters with pride, watched over them with prayer. As Commander-in-Chief, I can report to you our armed forces fought with honor and valor. And as President, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.